What if the most profound truths about how we understand God's kingdom and our role in it were hidden in the ordinary? Today, I invite you on a journey, a journey of discovery, of searching, of fishing, of needing, and of planting. It's a journey that takes us to the heart of what it means to live in the kingdom of heaven as Jesus taught it. It's about small beginnings and great endings, about total commitment, about welcoming everyone, and about drawing from both the old and the new. It's about the surprising, often overlooked, yet profound treasures hidden in plain sight in our everyday lives. It's about the paradox of the mustard seed, the leaven, the treasure, the pearl, and the net. And it's a journey that invites us to reconsider, reimagine, and transform our lives in light of God's kingdom. Today, we explore together the collection of parables of Jesus from Matthew 13, and see what they reveal to us about the kingdom of heaven. Now, the main point we discover in this collection of parables is that the kingdom of heaven starts small, it demands all, it includes everyone, and embraces both the old and the new. Since all of this is true, then our call as followers of Jesus is to value small beginnings commit ourselves wholeheartedly to God's kingdom, to welcome everyone, and treasure both tradition and innovation in our faith journeys. Now, some of the problems we might have in answering this call is overcoming our impatience for immediate change. We want everything right now. Confronting our fear of total commitment to the kingdom. In this case, it's pointing to financial resources, these parables, but it can be more than that. Overcoming our biases to embrace all people. This one is especially difficult, especially in light of the fact that there's discussion about separating out the good and the bad, and that the bad will get theirs. And finding the balance between honoring tradition and welcoming innovation, which is another tough one, especially in old established churches that have a lot of tradition. Yet despite these challenges, Jesus assures us in this set of verses that with faith as small as a mustard seed, God's grace can guide us toward immense growth, wholehearted commitment, true inclusivity, and a harmonious blend of the old and the new. But some questions you might wonder when considering this are, how can we cultivate patience and faith in small beginnings in a world that often seeks instant gratification and grand outcomes? We want everything now and we want it to be big and bombastic. The idea of doing anything small in this country is a joke. We don't like that. We see that as weakness. We see that as failure. But we need to accept that our small steps today can lead to significant changes tomorrow. There's a great through line in some of those letters that we sent to the band. When I was in high school, a bajillion years ago, bajillion, <laughs> a long time ago, right? My senior year, you know, your senior year book, you go around, I don't know, I don't know, some of you are a little bit older than me, so I don't know if you did that then, but we would take our yearbook around to everybody and have them sign it, right? That's one of the things we did. Well, I went to some of my favorite teachers and had them sign it. Mr. Woods, I've talked about him here before. He is the reason, a big part of the reason why I'm even here today, because of the chances he gave me, even though I didn't deserve them. Well, I asked him to sign my yearbook, and he wrote in it this phrase. And being the music teacher, he used music symbols. And he wrote this, he said, don't be sharp, don't be flat, just be natural. And that has sat with me all of these years. I come back to it all the time. Don't be sharp, don't be flat, just be natural. And that's all I've ever been, is myself. And that's what he was telling me. Be that. Well, I got a chance to write some of those notes to the kids in the band this week as well. And you better believe I used that one. I used others too, but I wrote a few of those. Don't be sharp, don't be flat, just be natural. And some others took and saw that and they liked it. And so they wrote them too. Now fast forward and think about which one of those kids got that note that's going to sit with the rest of their lives and encourage them to be themselves in spite of what the world may try to do to them to make them conform to its image, it might try to make them sharp. It might try to flatten out their spirits. But we 
know that they just need to be themselves. It seemed like such a small thing. I'm sure when my teacher wrote it, he didn't think much of it. He just thought it was a cute little pithy saying. But it had a huge impact on me, and it could have a huge impact on the next generation too. Such a small thing. Took a couple of seconds to write, but might change the entire trajectory for one human being. We need to accept that our small steps today can lead to significant changes tomorrow. Another question you might have is how do we navigate the fear or hesitation of God, or I'm sorry, the fear or hesitation of giving our all in pursuit of the kingdom of God? Now, while it might seem daunting, remember that the joy and fulfillment we find in God's reign surpasses all worldly possessions and securities. A big bank account can buy me a lot, but it cannot buy me the feeling I felt when interacting with the Niles marching band boosters, or when seeing the pictures of gratitude from those students, or from hearing that they're going to be hanging those notes so that those students can see them every day when they leave that room. I can't buy that. I can't buy that. And I'm sure there's some sense of joy in your life that you realize is incalculable, like you could not put a price on it. We navigate the fear and hesitation of giving our all by seeking out that joy, by seeking that joy, remembering that that joy is primary above any sense of safety and security or riches or whatever that we have here and now. None of that means anything if we are miserable. None of that means anything if it can't bring us joy, and it can't. It might bring us some temporary pleasure or happiness, but it doesn't bring you joy. What practical steps can we take to genuinely embrace inclusivity in our communities? And I know I've said the word inclusive a bunch, and I'm going to say it a bunch more, and I know some of you are puckering up at that thought. That's okay. If you don't like inclusivity, you're going to hate the kingdom of heaven. How do we take practical steps to genuinely embrace inclusivity in our communities despite our biases? or our comfort zones, or even our fear of judgment in the end, because a lot of this, a lot of what we do as Christians to try and make sure the right people are in is out of genuine concern for their souls or, you know, however we want to place it. But we are not called to live into the fear of the end. We are called to embrace the enormity of inclusivity of the kingdom, which is not the same thing. We do this not by focusing on who might be in or out in the end times. We do this by breaking down barriers, welcoming diversity, and extending love without prejudice right here and right now. This one's going to this one's going to really bake your noodle. We did all of that for these kids this week, and we will do it again throughout the season when we feed them in the home games. But you do realize we showed love and support and encouragement to children who might be those people. Some of those kids are going to grow up to be those people, whichever those people you happen to think of. We fed and cared for and supported gay kids, straight kids, kids with liberal leanings, kids with conservative leanings, kids of faith, kids with no faith, nice kids, mean kids, those kids. We supported, nurtured, and just loved those kids. None of that mattered in the work that we did. None of it. And it shouldn't matter when gathering people into the kingdom of God. It shouldn't matter then. How can we better balance honoring tradition while also being open to fresh insights and innovations? How can we do this? How can we hold that tension between the old and the new? Well, rather than demonizing the old because it's old or the new because it's new, we need to be open to both. Christianity wouldn't even exist at all without Jesus' synthesis of the old and the new. And that's what he's pointing to here with that parable. The wise person is the one who embraces and cherishes the best of both. We were forced into this change due to the pandemic with our community meals, where we went from strictly in-person serving to to to-go, and now we're still on to-go. And truthfully, it's a different but just as impactful system. And I know some of you out there are going to say, it's not the same. We need to have them in the building sitting there discussing with each other. And there is something to be said about being in a room together. Absolutely. But the goal of Community Meal isn't to have people in a room together. 
The goal of Community Meal is to feed folks and show them the love of God. And we can do that in a whole lot of ways, and we do that just as well when they come through the drive through Oh, and by the way, we've talked to a bunch of those folks about coming back in person, and they don't want to. Many, many, many of those folks do not want to be back in the building. They want to come through, get their meal, have a hi, have a hello, have a how you doing, and be on their way. We balance out the tradition of our community meal with the innovation and newness of how we do it. The, the feeding the band is another example of this, where we take our tradition of feeding folks in this church, which is really one of the best things we do, and the thing, one of the things we are really, really, really good at. We take that old tradition of feeding, and we found a completely new way to do it. And when we were first talking about doing it, there was a discussion about having them come into the fellowship hall and eating their meal and being that. We discarded that so fast because, again, the goal of that mission is not to have people in the building. The goal is to feed the kids, make them feel loved, welcome, respected, and cared for like they matter. And they don't need to come here for that. Could they have gotten those things? Sure. But that, making them come here, is more about us than it is about them. And that is how mission works in the church these days going to them. If we continue to try to get people here, do everything to get them here, we're missing the mark. We are missing the point. We make it about ourselves. We center ourselves rather than the people we're serving because we're not really serving them then. We're giving them a carrot on a stick, and that's not the same. The Gobi Church, the digital church I've been appointed to plant, is another synthesis of honoring tradition, of community building and worship, while doing it in a completely different way than history has ever allowed it to be done before. It's this holding the, the love for the old while also embracing the new in a joyful way. That is what we're called to do. That is what Jesus did. That is why Christianity even exists. I am so thankful that we are already living into the future we want to see in some ways and that we have the ability to improve upon that by going and being Jesus to folks. So how do we go be Jesus to folks in this way? We can go be Jesus by having faith in small beginnings. We can strive to do small acts of kindness, justice, and love in our everyday lives, trusting that these will contribute significantly to the expansion of God's kingdom on earth. We can go be Jesus by seeking the kingdom wholeheartedly. We can dedicate our lives to making the pursuit of love, justice, and peace our highest priority even and especially if that means giving up our personal comfort and material possessions. We can go be Jesus by embracing inclusivity. We can welcome all people into our communities and hearts, extending God's love without prejudice or distinction. We can strive to create spaces that are welcoming, inclusive, and affirming of everyone's dignity. Now let me take one aside here. This isn't a but. This is an explanation because I know somebody's going to come up to me after the service and say, but what about the rest of that passage that talks about the separating out and the good and the bad and the weeping and gnashing of teeth? Well, as I pointed out last week to those of you who are here or those of you who are with us online, it's not our job to do the separating. Jesus says it very, very plainly here that when the time comes for the separating, the angels are going to do it. Ours is just to cast the net. Cast the net as wide as possible. Connect with as many people as possible. Welcome everybody into the kingdom. It is God's job to determine who the good and who the bad are. And as I pointed out last week, it is extremely likely that some of those that we think are the bad ones <laughs> are going to be standing right next to you, elbow and elbow, assuming you make it at all. Because the ones we expect to be there, some of us we might find missing. So you don't have to worry about who's in and who's out. All you got to worry about is learning how to cast a net, because that is what your job is. That is what my job is. That is our collective job. Cast the net, gather them all in, and let God do God's work. Because we're not God. We don't know. We think we do. We think it's about following the rules as we have determined them to be. And if you want to sit there and say, well, the Bible says dot, dot, dot. Yeah, there are a lot of things the Bible says that we don't give a hoot about. You might think that's not true, but I defy you to let me know how many of those Leviticus laws you're following outside of the homosexuality one. Yeah, we've decided some of them just aren't important anymore. So my point is, 
the laws and rules that we set up aren't necessarily the ones upon which we will be judged. In fact, Jesus said they're not. Jesus said as long as we love others and love God and do everything in our power to live those two things out, we will have fulfilled God's law. We will have fulfilled God's law. So we can go be Jesus by valuing both the old and the new. We do this by honoring traditions and wisdoms of our faith while also being open to the new insights and understandings and practices of our time. This means cultivating an attitude of learning and growing, welcoming new perspectives, and being willing to adapt and involve our faith practices when necessary. Essentially, internalizing the teachings of Jesus leads to living a life more closely aligned with the principles of the kingdom of heaven, increasing in love, inclusivity, justice, humility, and wisdom. The kingdom of heaven starts small and demands all. It includes everyone and embraces both the old and the new. Those are the hallmarks of people living under God's reign, and those are the hallmarks of people seeking that reign here and now. Amen? Amen. Amen.